The Girls Don't Sing is a DJ group made up of myself, Hannah Lynch, Matty Chiabi and Sophia Violet. We all met during lockdown with four different individuals from four different, you know, places, heritages. So that's four different identities in music like coming together. Can you remember the moment when you realised that the industry and the pressures and the demands were having an effect on your well-being? Yeah. Well-being. Yeah. I think I was in this like box full of like self-loathing, overthinking anxiety. And I do we do always say it like the respect that we have, I've said it to you, the respect I have for solo DJs, I don't know how you did it. Like, I don't, like, the struggle and the complications that come with, like, navigating all of those emotions and the highs and the lows and the travelling and the this and the that by yourself. I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have the girls. I think I could have gone to a really dark place if I hadn't. So if you could envision a future where the challenges didn't have as much of an impact on you, what would that look like? Hmm. I think I'd be... So Gaia. Hello Gemma. <laughs> Thanks so much for taking the time to speak to us. So just for people who might not know who Girls Don't Sing is, mm -hmm. give a little bit of heads up about how it started and how it's going. So Girls Don't Sing is a DJ group made up of myself, Hannah Lynch, Matty Chiabi and Sophia Violet. We all met during lockdown. Matty's my friend from home. Me and Hannah met because we started doing workshops at a youth club in Liverpool. And Sophia was DJing at the club that I was working in. And I don't know, just because she was, you know, a girl coming to play. We just kind of like bonded over that and I remember her being quite nervous so we stayed in contact um, and then it just kind of happened quite naturally actually um, I had an idea for a video like mix series um, you know showcasing female DJs from all across the country and then my boss at the time at the club that I was working in was like look this has legs why don't we move it from a mix series online to an event and this was during the time of like when everyone had to like sit down so it was very very tame <laughs> um, and we just started to build up from there re really we joined a radio called Foundation FM which is female led in London so and obviously Matty being based in London we started doing more bits in London started playing at Liverpool more obviously when lockdown kind of like fully opened up um, we had our first like taste of like you know DJing together in a club and I think people really saw like how like special and electric it was and so did we um so what started as something quite like wholesome and the kind of whole ethos as well like at the time when we were putting like, our, on our own events was showcasing like younger DJs so they'd always like warm up for us whether it be their first time playing or like they'd have minimal experience we wanted to create like that space for them and yeah they were really really fun and then we started doing I don't know more yeah different events um throughout throughout that time London Liverpool Manchester just based off like the little connections that we already had that it was still like snowballing into into something quite exciting and we knew that what we had was different we're, we're four mates we're women we're playing you know these genres that I don't know that are like quite nostalgic essentially like I was saying the other day this guy was asking me like how does it work with your music and I when I was explaining it to him and I was like we're four different individuals from four different you know places heritages so that's four different identities of music like coming together and it sounds sick like not to take our own horn but it does sound <laughs> sick um because it's, it's personality, it's identity, and we just kind of like fuse that all together. And obviously like our connection when we play, because we're such a visual act, um, I think people really can see that. And I think that was really captured after our Mix Mag. So we did a Mix Mag lab in December, which is crazy, because that's almost like a, a year now. Um, and so much has happened since then. But I think the Mix Mag was the real moment of just like everything kind of changed, because that went online. We were terrified about that coming out. Yeah. I remember me and Matty asked the guy, the video guy for Mix Mag, we were like, look, after we did it. I think it's because it's filmed and there's so much pressure and we were already like, I don't know, anticipating all these comments and yeah. all this backlash and we're naturally really harsh on ourselves because we're young, we're women. Um, and you know, we've got to feel like we've got to step up to the plate even 10 times harder. And I was just really getting in my head. There's even moments in the mix mag that maybe if you watch it now, you'll be able to realize I'm literally looking at Matt and I'm like, <laughs> Like, and it's really noticeable, and I think because we forgot we were being filmed and we were so in our heads about everything being perfect, we just kind of crumbled at the end. I remember saying to the guy, please don't put it up. And Matty was joking, saying that she was gonna like pour water on the, on the, on the filming stuff. Um, but then the irony with that was that, that that video basically acted as a catalyst for like our whole career up to this point. So then after the back of that, um, we got a manager, an agent, and have had a mental summer playing at some amazing festivals and things haven't really slowed down and they're still, very much going um, but I think our ethos and you know what we stand for has always stayed the same um, and you know we want to with our kind of like group and with our like the noise that around us we obviously want to continue to bring up other women and I don't know call people out and be defiant in actually creating sustainable change within the music industry not just for us but mm -hmm. for the next generation for for women that are currently and, and non-binary and trans um, any other kind of underrepresented gender 
um, to the forefront, um, not only being accepted, but being celebrated in, in the yeah. way that they should be. Yeah, so, yeah. definitely, yeah, cool. So we spoke on the phone for the first time when we first met, and yeah. we kind of really kind of connected straight mm -hmm. away, I think, because obviously when I was DJing... I it felt was emotional talking to you. I know, I did. I, actually, I think I, I did. must have like cried a bit. Yeah, it was mad, because I think obviously I was DJing a few years ago, and mm -hmm. you're DJing now, and mm -hmm. you're so like so new on the scene. Mm -hmm. So when we had that conversation, it was like literally for, like we were just going through exactly the same things now. It like took me back, and it's just mm -hmm. so weird. And even for me, even all these years later, like I still haven't even spoken to people about it in, mm -hmm. in detail as, as I have with you. It's so, so hard to, to explain well. it to somebody that has no like that has no idea. I think mm -hmm. when you actually experience it, it yeah. is so crazy. Yeah. And yeah. the highs and lows that come with that. I think articulating that to somebody that is so like far away from that world, whether it be your best mate, whether it be your mum, I think when you actually have like hands on experiences, yeah. like being in those moments, like it's just, it's mental. Yeah, it's it such a mental. unique experience mm -hmm. and the challenges are so unique to the music mm -hmm. industry. So it was, yeah, it was such a mad conversation. And I, I love being able to connect with you mm -hmm. over that. It was Me like, too. oh. Um, so just going back to when you started, obviously the way you just explained that is kind of a little bit of a whirlwind. Mm -hmm, it kind of mm -hmm. just happened really organically. Very fast. So I guess that I was going to ask you, were you aware before you started DJing that working in music could be challenging? Was that in your awareness or was it just kind of like it all just snowballed and suddenly you were in it? I think so. I think I've always had an awareness just because it's it's another it's another form of like putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. I came from an acting background, which was always like performative and having an audience. And, and I think I was kind of used to that pressure. And I, I think I liked it, especially the drama school. Like I liked having an audience. There were there were times that I was like painfully nervous mm. before going on stage and just like felt sick. But then the moment that I am on stage and I've calmed those nerves down, like it just it sounds a bit naff, but like it's the best feeling in the world. Yeah, it is. And yeah. I really really enjoyed it. And I and I've I felt really similar feelings with with DJing that that nervousness before, especially mm. now being able to share that nervousness essentially with my best friends. Yeah, yeah. Before our last set at Glastonbury, we were all just like. <sighs> We couldn't speak like we were just like shaking and i knew that the minute we got on stage that would all go mm -hmm. and it was just like yeah having that place of just like it's so ironic that the place of like calmness and like you know being able to ground ourselves is on the stage with the speakers around us and like it, yeah. being in the chaos mm -hmm. i mean it's that run up before that would make me make me feel like physically sick i actually used to vomit quite a bit mm -hmm. when i was in drama school just because the nerves were so bad and i just felt really yeah. anxious and um, anxiety, yeah 100 like yeah. i had no idea i'll be honest i had no idea of the like extremities of like being at, at this point in the music industry like of, of this kind of like exposure and this like being seen I think mm -hmm. it's a lot about being seen for me and, and that kind of like I don't know I feel like I'm constantly at a crossroad of like oh my god I've got a post or I've got to be seen or I've got to do this and if I take a day off then uh, and it's just about finding that finding that balance of I don't know putting yourself out there and staying relevant mm -hmm. and you know like being present and you know like being seen that you're like working and getting booked but also protecting yourself and just taking a break because yeah, then it, it's a whirlwind otherwise yeah i think it's quite common i've heard a lot of artists talk about like the pressure of yeah. like not being able to say no yes and that obviously at the beginning I, I, I did everything Gemma. like i did everything i would be out of pocket same with girls don't sing so me as a solo dj and that's we all still solo dj we all solo dj before um so we all do our own individual sets and obviously when we come together we do girls don't sing but we as gaia as girls don't sing we would either be out of pocket going to sets like getting no money at all and just saying yes to everything like mm. there were times i'd have to wake up at like 4 a.m 5 a.m and it's so interesting now particularly when we announced glastonbury like, like in summer there were so many people like what like how and it's like well you don't know how many things mm. we've bloody done like we have like sh like spread ourselves so thin over the course of the year even before mix mag and if you go on our instagram you can see that to like get to this position and i think that kind of like those early stages people kind of ignore it where I was like, do you know what I mean? Or like they don't really like see it because maybe it doesn't have value. It's not the Glastonbury's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's the little things. It's, it's traveling, it's, it's this, it's that. It's being completely out of pocket. It's, you know, being at the bottom of the lineup in, in writing that's that big, but mm. we're still doing it and we're still getting experience and we're still putting ourselves out there. So I think, yeah, I didn't realize like at this stage. And also we're still scratching the surface. We're still finding our feet mm. with like, you know, being in this position and hopefully it will get greater and, you know, dealing with the pressure that comes with that. Um, yeah. We'll cross that bridge when we get there, I think. Because <laughs> I think everyone's artist, every artist's reason for not saying no is mm. going to be different and unique mm. to them. And I know some people have said that if you feel like if you say no, if you miss some gigs, then another DJ is going to come along and take mm -hmm. over or they're going to lose the progress yeah. that they've made. Or there might be external pressure from the team or just not being able to... Obviously, you're working with your mates as well, mm -hmm, so you, mm -hmm, I can imagine mm -hmm. you don't want to want to let them down yeah. either. So what is it for you, do you think, that we're, when you can't say no to them? I think it's about letting people down 100%. I feel all the girls I, or your team everyone everyone, everyone. and um, the promoters just like I feel like especially if like 
this week actually I was supposed to play in London just me on Saturday um, and I'd advertised it like I'd promoted it um, and I just felt awful I felt really run down um, there was no way I could have justified getting on a train it, with the way that I felt I, I was struggling to even like go to the toilet my eyes were watering I just felt really felt really low felt really knackered and I knew that if I had gone to this set it would have set me back again so I would have mm -hmm. traveled back the next day and I would have felt even worse like not only physically but also mentally mm -hmm. and I think only recently in the last couple of months I've just been like well I, I physically I think before before summer I'd get incredibly anxious about letting people down and saying no mm -hmm. whereas now it's like we have to say no because one we have too much stuff like coming our way we can't do it all whereas mm. before we did do it all yeah um, and for me like as a solo DJ it's like well I think I've got a little bit more strict with myself out, out of saying no because I physically I physically cannot and I think that's also comes with me being a little bit more I don't know caring a bit, a bit about myself more and being a bit yeah. more responsible with like actually no I, I can't do it I can't come to London today mm. um and I think separating those anxious thoughts of like, oh my God, everybody's gonna hate me. I've let everybody down. You know, think people are gonna be talking about me. Oh my God, this, this, that. To being like, well, nobody's actually asked. Mm. Nobody's actually asked. What feels so detrimental in my head, for me, nobody else actually cares. Mm. Yes, it may be a bit of an inconvenience, but what will be a bigger inconvenience is if I go there and I do the set and I don't know, God mm. forbid, I don't know, I could collapse. One of my friends has collapsed during mm. a set. Like, you know, it could happen. So I think, being stricter with myself and putting myself first and not letting these like niggling voices in my head like kind of get the better at me and kind of bully me into saying yes because what yeah. I'm, I'm scared yeah. of like letting people down yeah but. and you discuss that with the girls as well yeah. like you're super understanding 100%. if someone needs to cancel and stuff 100%. like that 100% even just like it's not even just about like you know saying no because of like our well-being but also how now because you know the sets are so they're a workout, I'll be really honest with you. They yeah. are, they're, they're so visual and they're so heavy and mm -hmm. we put so much into them and it's like, this this summer, we really spread ourselves thin. We were doing maybe two festivals, um, you know, in a weekend, going here, going there, traveling. And as much as it was so exciting, when we'd come back, we'd all be absolute shells of human. Mm. So it's one thing, you know, p preserving our well-being, but also like, from a strategic angle, like, is this set and is this booking gonna like, catapult us a bit more like is it you yeah. know is it necessary like is it the kind of lineup that we want to be part of like I think starting to think like that and protecting our brand and our sound and you know doing maybe more tastemaker stuff and just playing in the places and the venues that we really really want to mm -hmm. um and being a bit more selective with that I think is um is what is the angle that we're going at now yeah. so can you remember a time when you in the industry you were going like you know not to 100 can you remember the moment when you realized that the industry and the pressures and the demands were having an effect on your well-being yeah i think and i'm pretty sure my friends will agree with this after glastonbury like even when we were there i just felt like i was just like in this like incubator of anxiety like i, I felt so seen and I felt really, really paranoid. And I know it sounds really stupid, but about like what I was wearing on stage and I was really paranoid that my ass was out. Yeah. Like really paranoid. And again, this is something that male DJs will never have to worry about. If they've got their top off, it's like, oh, hey, hey. Like, do you know what I mean? It's, it kind of adds to the performance. Like nobody would ever like think to sexualize them or anything like that. And I was really paranoid that my ass was out. And it sounded really stupid, but I got so in my head and I felt so seen and everybody was tagging us in stories. And it got to the point I was like, oh my God, I felt like my phone was like a hot potato. Like I, I didn't want to keep it in my hand. And mm. The more we were getting tagged in stories and like the, like it was like all these like Instagram notifications were just going beep, 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 beep in my head. And I just felt this like wave of just like, oh my God, like severe, like beer fear, like beer fear on yeah. a night out. Yeah, yeah, Think yeah. about like you on a night out and you've been a bit like, you yeah. know, you've had a few too many drinks. Day. It's like that times a thousand because I was on a stage performing to, I don't know how many people, it was a massive stage, Lonely Hearts, a, a, a big, pretty big crowd mm. on those massive screens as well. So it's like that feeling just intensified and also documented like it's online it's there people have it on their phones mm. and I just remember like Matty one of the other girls my best mate just being like Gaia like relax like it's really not that bad and because we're best friends there's that element of truth where if it was bad she'd be like yeah not gonna lie yeah. and because that's what we're like yeah, we are yeah, honest yeah. with each other we're best mates mm -hmm. and we have that relationship where we can be transparent with each other and it's fine she was like Gaia I, I would honestly tell you if it was bad and it's not bad and I just felt so, so painfully anxious. And I was like, yeah, this, this is mad. I've never been the one to care about like the way I look. Like I'm normally on stage, like, like mm -hmm. having a laugh. Like I've never felt like I've been that heavily like critical about the way I look or scrutinize myself because I'm just mm -hmm. not asked. I'm, 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 more, I'm more concerned about having fun and being comedic. Like I'm a bit of a, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm a yeah. bit of a joke and a bit of a kind of like a clown. And I, I've never really minded, but 
I think because we'd done those three massive sets and it was such a big thing to be at Glastonbury and the pressure that came from that and mm. being seen and like there were even moments where we were like walking through the festival like when we weren't playing or when it was really late and like people were coming up to us and those moments of just like people just shoving their cameras in our faces mm. being like oh my god these girls don't sing like mm. not asking not having any bound not having any boundaries and we went and played in Malta for Annie Max Festival and we were with Tiffany Calver who's an incredible DJ really renowned really respected we've loved her for a very long time and we spent a bit of time with her there and her kind of like industry is more like rap um it's just a completely different world to an electronic scene so she was saying like it's really nice to be at this festival because like nobody knows me I can kind of mm. you know sit back relax yeah. and she was there and she was witness to people coming up to us being like oh my god girls don't sing and I just remember her saying like really plainly you know you don't have to take pictures with anybody like you, you don't have to do that yeah but I think with all of us our brand has kind of been like being really personable like this girl messaged us and she was like it feels like when I'm at your set it feels like I'm in the toilet of a girl's bathroom and we love mm. that and we do have a really personable connection with with our audience and with women it is with women mm. and it's about like you know being what we always say that like, you can't be what you can't see. And our manager said like, he was always known, so there's always just a line of girls at the front of like every set and mm. having that kind of relationship and being really personable because one, we're not that far off in age. Yeah. We're very similar. We're ravers as well. We love mm. a good time. We love the music that we're playing. We love a night out. So there's that relatability there that I think makes us different from other DJs. It's a party. We don't take ourselves too seriously. We want to invite people in. We want to bring the girlies on stage and give them a shot and things like that and create that kind of space. But what comes with that is like, that fear of being able to be like, do you know what, I don't want a picture because we've like kind of lived up to that hype and that expectation. Mm -hmm. When Tiffany said that, I was like, I don't really feel like I can actually. I don't really feel like I can say no. Yeah, you didn't know how to do it in the nicest yeah, way. Yeah, because then, then I'll be concerned about coming across as like, yeah. I don't know, rude or I don't know, yeah. creating like a bad name for ourselves and I don't know, people thinking that, you know, we're a bit stuck up. Mm. So there were definitely moments like that to me. I was like, ah, like, yes, like get, get, getting a picture like yeah. with these girls really excited as well and like, I think particularly as well, like at a festival, like the stakes are really high for everybody, regardless if you're playing, regardless if you're working it, regardless if you're just going as a punter. And it's just a bit like, oh, like there's that energy there that's electric and really exciting. But when you're playing, so when you're technically working, but also we're young and we love, we've never, none of us have ever been to Glaston before. So we also want to navigate that festival as just young ravers who love music and want to, you know, when we're not playing, one of my friends, Skepsis, he was like, I can't believe that you guys go. And he's a DJ, really, really, like, really working, like, loads. Been in this industry for ages. He was like, I can't believe that you guys go to festivals and, like, party and, like, go around. Like, if I'm playing at a festival, like, I'm, I'm chilling. Like, I'm just, do you know what I mean? I'm in the green room. And we're like, no, because this is all new to us. We want to soak it up. Like, going to see somebody else's DJ set is just as important for us. Do you know what I mean? We want to, like, immerse ourselves in that. So it's about, like, just, like, protecting yourself and, you know, but also we want to have fun and we, we want to experience it all. So it's about finding that balance, which we're still finding. Yeah. But Glastonbury was definitely the moment that I was like, yeah, this is really hitting me now. This exposure, um, thinking like really intrinsically about the way I look, feeling really paranoid, not wanting to go on my phone, feeling really like anxious, um, overthinking about, you know, the footage that people may have and the stuff that people have seen, who was in the audience, like all of these really like, I don't know, just really... Um, I don't know, it felt like a lot of like self-loathing ideas that didn't have to be, didn't have to be there. And I do think that if I didn't have the girls around me, what kind of hole could I have got into? Mm -hmm. If I would have like, do you know what I mean, been in this, like I said, it was just like I was in this like box full of like self-loathing, overthinking anxiety. And I do, we do always say it like, the respect that we have, I've said it to you, the respect I have for solo DJs, I don't know how you did it. Mm -hmm. like, I don't like the struggle and the complications that come with like navigating all of those emotions and the highs and the lows and the traveling yeah. and the this and the that by yourself. I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have the girls. I think I could have gone to a really dark place if I hadn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very, very difficult as a solo, solo mm. artist. So going back to Glastonbury, do you feel like, because obviously there is that conflict, like you're new mm -hmm. on the scene, like you said, you want to go and enjoy yeah, it. Yeah. So I've been there, for, that's the first time you've been to Glasgow. I've mm -hmm, been there mm -hmm, to Glasgow. I know mm -hmm, what it's like, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. unreal. So how did you navigate that? Did you, obviously, well-being DJ is always in conflict with mm. the party culture. It's mm. always the way it is. Mm -hmm. So um, did you manage to get any sleep? Did you consider that? Or were you just like, I'm just going to go through? I think like there were definitely moments. So like before some of our sets, we were just in our caravan, just like chilling, having a few drinks with each other. Um, I think we all felt like those nerves and we all felt like, look, this is different to any festival we've played at. Mm. Um, so, you know, there were definitely moments we were just like in our caravan. <coughs> which definitely helped. There's nowhere I could have camped. There's nowhere I could have like yeah, had like an achy back, no. Yeah. Um, so it was a tight squeeze in the caravan. 
Um, but I'm just glad we had somewhere warm. We had somewhere we could just like, I think having your own private space before mm -hmm. those sets, whether it's the green room. And we've always like kind of had issues of just like, not getting to the green room quick enough or the green room being really crowded or like, you know, being full of like, eh, eh, eh. like all we want to do is just take a moment, particularly after the set I've noticed. For me anyway, my, the, that space after the set is almost more, is almost more important to me than before because mm -hmm. I need that space to be like, whoa, yeah. like away from everyone, I feel like a little bit like numb. My mum and dad came to see us play at Printworks and that was the first time they'd seen Girls Don't Sink play, the first time they'd seen me play and because it was such like a big crowd as well, I think they really, especially my dad, really realised like, Jesus, like it's big stuff this and it, it comes a lot with a lot of like, whew. and my dad's always been that person to like, you know, tell me to breathe and, you know, practice all this stuff and really try and like, you know, enforce it into me and um, yeah, emphasise the importance of, you know, breathing and, you know, taking those time, you know, that time, especially breathe. My dad always tells me to breathe, to breathe, to breathe. And after I came off stage, I was just like, oh my God, he was like, right, just take a minute. And I think mm. he saw firsthand, like, bloody hell, it, it is a lot. Yeah. It is a lot. But um, I think Glastonbury was like, I think we, we had a good balance of, you know, preserving our energy. Let's, let's call it that. Preserving our energy, staying in the caravan, getting some pizza, getting some chips, um, especially because on the first day we had two sets. Mm -hmm. So we did the first set. It felt like for me, I gave all my beans to that first set. And by the second one, I remember turning to Matty being like, Jesus, like I am dipping, dipping, dipping. And how long after was the second set? A few hours, like two, wow, three hours. Yeah. Um, and I remember being interviewed before and I was just like, like wake up, wake mm. up, wake up. Um, and I was just thinking, I don't want to drink because I think if I drink, I'll just feel even more knackered and I need to stay awake and I need to stay vigilant. Um, but yeah, I think Glastonbury was a good, I think we are, all of us have gotten so much better from the beginning, gotten so much better at being like, we can't do it all. Mm. We can't like, it doesn't matter like we're all quite go-getters especially because we're experiencing all of this stuff like going to these countries that we've never been to before mm. playing in Heidelberg in Germany which was like this like Disney princess town that was just like mad and it's like what business would we have as Gaia, Matty, Sophia and Hannah going to this place like music has taken us there mm. so obviously like it's a balance of like we want to soak it all in and we want to wake up early and like we want to go out and do this and go and yeah. get brunch and go and tour the city but also sleep yeah sleep yeah. and rest yeah. And I think we're all of us are getting better at just being a bit stricter with that and being like, well, we can't do it all. We need we need to literally look after ourselves. Yeah. So how are you navigating? Obviously, music, working in music comes with a default of your sleep's going to be compromised, mm -hmm. full stop. So how are you navigating that at the moment? I think at night, it's when everything is like warm, especially after a set, like the mm -hmm. music, as you'll know, like yes, the music yeah. ringing in your ears, you've still got that like buzz. But that's the thing, it's difficult isn't it because like, like, I think we spoke about this on the phone with chat as well, like mm. coming off stage and mm -hmm. trying to get to sleep is one of the hardest mm -hmm. things that you're going to be able to do, especially if you're trying to get to sleep when it's daylight outside. Yeah. Oh my goodness, I know. the birds, like oh, the birds are there and you're <laughs> like, your yes. brain. it's daytime. I know, like, I know, no, I know. No. Well, there's cool little hacks that I like I found out recently, which is quite good. Like, because obviously you, the light enters your eyes and that mm. tells your brain, your whole body mm. that it's day, that mm. daytime. So when you come out of the club, put sunglasses on. Mm. before you if you're going to i don't know your hotel or if you've mm -hmm, got to travel mm -hmm. put sunglasses on so don't let your eyes get in contact with daylight that's very smart i'm going to do that so yeah because people are going to think i'm off my face yes but, it doesn't but, matter. I, will, but I will do that it doesn't matter and just keep them on until you get into a hotel room close all the curtains mm. you know put a little low light mm. on and that's keep a very it good dark idea. until you actually want to go to sleep because mm -hmm. the second the light goes in your eyes your whole body yeah. knows it's daytime even though you're sleep deprived mm -hmm. you may both get to sleep yeah so there's loads of little hacks like that okay. that will really make a difference cool and obviously even if you just get a little routine like a chill routine mm -hmm. like Breathing is really good as well, mm. like your dad said. I don't mm. know what kind of pattern he's kind of mm -hmm, recommended, mm -hmm, like the, mm -hmm. the box breathing, four mm -hmm. in, four holes. Did I tell that you that story one? about the, the woman at, um, in, in Malta? So yeah. we came off stage and there was like no security. It was our last final set, so I think red light couldn't play and they asked us if we wanted to close the stage, like last minute. And obviously, again, we were like, yes, like obviously, <laughs> because like we jump at these chances mm. naturally. Again, like we're new, like it's all new to us. and. Like, you know, we, we don't think about the comedy. We, do, we just wanted to do it. And we, we threw ourselves in over summer, like, so wholeheartedly with just everything we had. And um, we did the last set and we, we were buzzing and, like, people were just, like, cli literally, like, climbing on us. It was mad. And there was no security, like, backstage. So everybody kind of just, like, ran backstage. And it was all just a bit like, whoa. Like, we all having that feeling of just, like, feeling a little bit like what I was saying about, like, having that space to calm down. Mm. We were trying to do that, but then, like, everybody was there. So, like, trying to socialise, I felt like I was a robot. I was like, mm. oh, my God, like, I felt very aware, like, very self-conscious. Like, it was kind of like an out-of-body experience. No security, nothing there. Um, 
I remember the security being like, you need to leave, you need to leave. But we, we couldn't leave because we needed to calm down. And we were there and we were all just a bit on edge. And I remember snapping at Sophia and she, she was crying and then I was crying and it just, it felt like way too much. And there was this woman that was in the crowd that we'd met at the first set at the festival who was Asian, she was Punjabi. And I just kind of connected with her because I played one of the tracks and so I invited, she, I heard her singing obviously in a crowd full of white faces, obviously you're, you're gonna notice that. So we pulled her on stage, we had a little moment, we pulled her a glass of moe, <laughs> had a little party with her and she was staying in contact and she said that she had tickets to the other closing party but she was like, now I've seen that you're playing, I've mm. sacked them off, I'm gonna come and see you guys. So she was there. She's backstage with us and she just took us to the corner, she's a doctor. And she sat with us and she did that box exercise. Oh, there you go. Amongst all this chaos. And I remember mm. somebody came over and I was like, go away. I was like, please leave us alone. Like mm. that was when I was just like, I, I cracked because I was just like, we need, we need to just have this moment and we need to be able to breathe. And at that point, I didn't care what people thought of me. I that just went out the window. I was like, leave us alone. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it was like something so special that this woman, especially being a woman as well, mm. like, and being a brown woman and having that connection of like playing Punjabi music in the first set and then her coming and then offering us this like, she created Support, that space that within space, within yeah. all this chaos. And she always messages me and she always stays in contact and she always messages me like, just checking in, like, how are you feeling? And I don't know, she's she's really, really lovely. And um, I just thought that was, that was really mm. special. And yeah. that kind of stuff doesn't really happen. Like, mm. let alone, do you know what I mean? Like at, at, at a bloody festival. Yeah. Um, and it really, really helped us. And it was, yeah, it was quite a moment. Yeah. So yeah, the box thing. The we've, box um, breathing is yeah. amazing. Like the science behind it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's all there. Um, there's loads of like strategies you can do. Obviously you've got your sunglasses, mm -hmm. avoid light time, you've got breathing. I don't know if you could even put it in your rider where you need that space afterwards. We have. Have you got it in I there? think we have. I, I'm pretty work? sure. Um, I think it's more about like, how can we police like a whole entire green room if it's like communal? Do you know what I mean? We're not, we're not the only pe pe people on the lineup. Yeah. If there's like you know a plethora of other artists that all need the green room mm. you know yeah, and also we're, we're also conscious being like everybody at the green room like obviously we wouldn't do that but yeah, yeah, yeah. i think it's just about being i don't know finding our own way like if we don't have that space mm. how do we create ourselves is yeah, it a moment yeah, in the yeah. lose is it a step outside and have a quick cigarette yeah, and just exactly. you know let you know step away from that and also because there's four of us we're all going to react differently we're all mm. going to be able to want different things matty might want to go straight into the crowd mm. sophia might want to have a drink Hannah might want to step outside for a little vape. So it's yeah, just yeah, about yeah. being conscious about all of our needs in that moment mm. um, and making sure that we all take the time. It might take us all different lengths of time as well to kind of get to that place of like, oh, whoa. Especially there's been times where it's like, can we have a picture? Like, can we, can we get a picture after? And at the beginning we'd be like, yeah, like, like yeah. Mm. And now we've been like, can we just like have a minute? And you know, I think we're being a little bit stricter about our boundaries and, and our, our battery, like our social battery levels, yeah, yeah, especially yeah. when we come off stage. I feel like mine's at zero. I've given mm. a, I've given all my battery to the crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I guess it's a lot of it's to do with knowing yourself yes. and knowing what strategies that you all yes. do, like you say, and then taking that autonomy yourself to make that happen. I think I know my strategies now. I think yeah. particularly after the summer, um, going on walks, cleaning. Cleaning makes me feel so good. Mm. Cooking as well. Spending time to like do an activity that for me is quite like therapeutic and I can actually see the results. Like for me, like dedicating time to cleaning my flat. I don't know, it makes me feel really satisfied and like, being kind of organisational and like being off my phone essentially. Mm. <coughs> when I'm cooking or cleaning, I'm not on my phone. <coughs> That'll be the vapes. Um, so yeah, having that time to just like really switch off. Um, I know. I think I know. <coughs> pardon me. What I need to do to kind of calm myself down and like bring me back to a grounded place. So like when you're on the road with the girls, obviously the loneliness side of things, it's not going to be as bad for you because obviously you're with, yeah. you're with your mates and stuff. But do you ever feel any sense of like missing home or just not quite right? Right now, you're... I'm really missing home. Oh, yeah. I called my mum like yesterday, and I was just like, I really miss you. I'm going home. I just really, yeah, I really miss home. And I think because I've not been well, I've just felt a bit run down. Mm. I've been really tired. My granddad passed away recently as well, and I oh. feel like that really affected me. And um, I feel like, yeah. When that happened, I was like, right, like I just tried to like crack on and do loads of things and just try and stay busy. And I don't know, I didn't take the time out that I really needed just mm. to like switch off. And I remember like promoters emailing me being like, can you post this? Can you post that? And I just put something in my story because I wasn't on my social media. And I just said, I'm going through something at the moment. Please just have a bit of patience with me. Like, mm. I'm, you know, I'll get there when I get there. Um, and, you know, I was messaging promoters like just being like, I'm just I need a bit of time. And I think there's that misconception of like, I'm not a robot, I'm, I'm a human being, you know, yeah. of course my life is quite, you know, 
exposed and I'm in the music industry, but also normal things can happen. I can grieve, people can pass away. Mm. I can have problems with my boyfriend, I can yeah, have problems exactly. with my family. And I think there's that kind of like illusion that we're just like these like cardboard cutouts of just like DJs, like, hey, like that's not my whole life. I'm a human being. Other things are gonna happen to me that will affect me and will affect my well being and will affect my ability to DJ and to put myself out there and my reluctancy to maybe be on social media. And I think the more people who begin to speak about that, the more we can kind of eradicate this stigma that we are these like walking, talking like machines in the music industry because sorry, life can life sometimes and you need to take the time to navigate that as Gaia, regardless of a member of Girls Don't Sink or is G33. Mm. <coughs> so yeah, I think recently I've really missed home. I've been feeling run down as you can <coughs> probably tell. Um, and I just remember calling my mum and I was like, I really miss my mum. And especially when I live by myself and I don't know, you want your mum, you want your mum. You, yeah, I mean? you want yeah. your mum and Especially for me, like, there's cultural things, like, I want my mum's cooking, I want to be at home, I want to, I don't know, there's all of that kind of stuff that kind of comes with, like, a big part of my identity, my mum's Italian, I don't know, being home and eating her food, and especially, like, food has always been something that's been such an integral part of, like, I don't know, my childhood and sp spending quality time, essentially. Um, so I do, I do miss that a lot. Um, but also, I kind of have that, I have that ability to kind of experience that kind of, I don't know, that togetherness and that family with the girls, which mm. sounds a bit cheesy, but it's true. Yeah, no, I can imagine you do, yeah. So when you're on the road, how do you keep in touch with everyone at home? WhatsApp, I always send my mum videos all yeah. the time that she plays relentlessly. My mum always watches our mix mag. Whenever I'm home, I can always like hear her playing it downstairs. <laughs> and she's always like really vigilant on the comments and things like that. I send my mum so many videos. So And, and I think my mum as well, like my mum loved electron loves electronic music. My mum loves like... My mum was at field day watching like Chemical Brothers like not long ago. Like my mum still really like has a big passion and a big love for like that world. And I think, um, I think yeah, she loves seeing like what we're up to and the music that we're playing and being like, oh, I love this song. Or, oh, I'm not sure about this song. Um, but yeah, videos, sending her videos. And I've had to like write a timetable of where I am like and just send it to her. Like oh, these yeah. are all of our dates because she's just like, where one, she's, one, where are you? Yeah, yeah. Second of all, she's just so intrigued. And like, I don't know, I think there's, a, there's an element of just like, I don't know, like being proud, especially like now, we're playing in spaces that aren't really like club centric. And that's really cool. Like playing at the rugby, playing at the w World um, Olympic um, Gymnastics like Championship. Like we're playing in all these like really strange, you know, all these strange spaces that, um, I don't know, I, it's an accolade. I don't know any other DJs that have played at the rugby um, mm -hmm. or have been asked to play at the rugby. And it's just a bit like, yeah, it's um, the fact that we're like getting recognition and it's about respect as well from like loads of different like, I don't know, elements of the, of the world and like society. I think it's, it's um, pretty cool, but ultimately, I don't think we give ourselves enough credit about like how different we are. There isn't any other, mm. there isn't any other like female DJ groups, you know, doing like the stuff that we're doing. Mm. And I think because everything is so like one after the other, we played at Warehouse and then the next morning we were on a flight to play in, in Bergheim. We don't allow ourselves to have that time and be like, do you know what, yeah. that was sick. Or like, this is, this. I'm pretty proud of that. Or this is brilliant, like, because it's so fast paced, we don't allow ourselves the time to one, really congratulate each other and really like cement, cement these moments because they are moments. Yeah, well the thing is, I think the, the speed, the pace that you say, that you're going from one gig to the next, mm -hmm. I know I experience the same thing, mm -hmm. you're like, you know, you play, play a gig and you're just buzzing off that and then you're cart mm -hmm. off into a car, into mm -hmm. a hotel room, That's flight it. or whatever. And like you say, you're not, you're not having that process mm -hmm. to, to kind of enjoy it really. And, and it's only when people like, we all get it when people are like, oh my God. And I think we all have a bit of a sh like, not we, not that we feel a discomfort when people are like, you're just smashing it, you know, especially people from Liverpool because they've watched us come mm. from doing the little small scale events in lockdown. They've, this community here in the city have watched our journey like flourish and they've watched it like firsthand. So especially when people from here, people from London, strangers on the train, it's happened to me in Hannah and someone's been like, I'm so sorry, you and girls don't sing. And like, we're just like in disbelief. Like even the other day I was walking past town and there's a big poster for this festival in Austria. I sort of passed it. I was like, oh my God, there's our name. Like that, mm. those feelings and those interactions, those moments will never, will never sink in for me, mm. ever. And like when people tell us like, you're just smashing it, you know, you girls. And I'm just like, yeah. And I'm just like, oh, thank you. Like we feel a bit like, yeah, we don't know what to say. And it's like, actually, when we actually step back, we are smashing it. Mm. We've done a lot to be proud of. And I think when we're met with these compliments, we all get a little bit shy and a bit giggly because we don't know how to take it because it's still quite surreal for us, I think. Mm. Before we started recording, you mentioned about like you've been on the roads a lot, you're in hotel rooms a lot. <laughs> uh, what's that like? It's hard work, isn't it? You, you, like, you know, I just feel <laughs> like I have never felt such a deep appreciation for my own bed mm. ever. Um, 
and I think like growing up like staying in the hotel was always a luxury like it's not something that I did very like regularly um and I just feel like now it's like the essence of like I don't know like treating yourself to a hotel or like going on holiday it's just been lost because I'm just like I don't know they just feel so like rigid and cold and like not familiar and I feel like I can never really get a good night's sleep and mm. um I don't know they just feel quite clinical and I just feel like now because of like being on the road and staying in these hotels and going from A to B and C and D and going here and going there, like the thought of my own bed. This is the first week, so I've spent a full seven days in my own bed in Liverpool. And this is the longest time, amount of time in what feels like forever that I've stayed grounded in one place. And it's more about like the mental effect that, that has on me, like mm. getting on the train and the exhaustion that comes with that. It doesn't sound like a lot, but even like, a few weeks ago, I went to Berlin and Manchester. I was in Bristol, Birmingham, um, here, there. And I'd calculated that I'd been in like 11 cities in like 20 days. And I was like, that is, that is mental. And I think it's, it's the traveling for me. And particularly because of um, all, loads of these complications, and rightly so, you know, the strikes, I'm, I'm fully supportive of the strikes, but obviously the, the complications and the inconvenience that comes with really can make my anxiety really bad. I, re I recognize it in the last couple of months my anxiety really flares up when things are out of my control. So if I go to the station, there was one time I played in Bristol and I was supposed to be back in Liverpool because um, we did this um, Liverpool Freshers thing. I don't know if you saw it on our Instagram. No. We did this like, um, we wanted to spotlight loads of <coughs> local like Liver Liver Liverpool businesses and businesses, um, organisations and places, things to do in Liverpool that often get ignored by like the overall like Freshers, like, I don't know like phenomenon mm -hmm. so like talks to space businesses black owned businesses places that we like independent like female owned lash techs nails things like that so we wanted to create like a gds freshers guide so liverpool through the eyes of girls don't sink um to basically one expose you know students to these areas that they wouldn't know about necessarily coming to coming to liverpool for the first time and also you know creating that connection with us like introducing girls don't sink to these new students um so we basically made these discount cards and we handed them out and there was those like loads of discounts that they could use with these cards, so like our own student cards basically. And we made a little film that went with it and we went to all of these different places and our friend Dom filmed it. Um, and we were really excited about it. And I was supposed to go back to Liverpool to distribute the cards. And that was one of the moments I was like, I've let everybody down. Right. Because I got to the station, I got the first train, so it was like 9 a.m. I get there and the guys like, all trains are cancelled. And I was like, okay, um, what can I do? My option was maybe to go to London, get a coach to London and then get a train from London. and then. I ran to the coach station, I managed to get a train to Birmingham, but then when I got to Birmingham, I had to wait for like six hours. There were no trains back up, like no trains back up north. I had to get a coach to Manchester. My boyfriend had to pick me up. And in that moment, I remember just being on the coach in floods of tears. And I was like, oh my God, I've let everybody down. Like, you know, I need to distribute these cards. Eventually our friends just went and did it for us and it was absolutely fine. But I think in those moments of like the travel, like mishaps and all of those inconvenience and like the trains being delayed, I begin to get very, 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 very anxious. And I think it's a combination of exhaustion, mm -hmm. wanting to be home as quick as possible. Um, and then also like, if I've got plans, you know, I remember Matty when I was on holiday, I went on holiday with my boyfriend and I was on my phone and I kept being like, oh, sorry guys, I'm not gonna be on my phone today. But I was on my phone and Matty was like, stop messaging the chat. You're on holiday, like, please mm. stop. Nobody is gonna die. And we had some problems with the video and we needed to get the video out, but the video wasn't working and the subtitles weren't right. And I was just like, and my boyfriend was looking at me like I was like, like, Godzilla he was just like calm down mm. also he said it so simply like does anybody know this video is coming out no so mm. what does it matter if it's delayed or like yeah. the pressure that I begin to put on myself with these things and like getting everything perfect I think it's just like the control freak in me and you know it's about quality control and I want everything to do everything that we do to be done in full like, I don't want it to be done in half it has to be personal it has to be right and I think it's all pressure that I put on myself and I remember being on holiday, Matty being like, get off your phone. Mm. Stop messaging the chat. It's good that you got him there. And like, I remember, well. yeah, Matty just being like, nobody's going to die. Mm. Nobody's going to die. And I just remember being on the coach in floods of tears and just having a moment to myself. And I was like, nobody is going to die. Mm. I might. Like, if anybody's going to die, I will. Like, <laughs> I, I will probably. kill myself from feeling like this. And what I did was I went to Wagamama's and I just sat down. I watched a couple of episodes of something, had a glass of wine. And I was like, right, there's nothing I can do. I need to just change the way I think. There's physically nothing I can do. I can't run to Liverpool. Um, and I just have to sit in this moment. And what I did was I actually took a bit of time for myself, cut, catched up on a few episodes of shit reality TV, had a glass of wine, walked around Birmingham, and I just made the most out of that situation rather than sitting in this like state of panic. And it's like, do I rather sit in, would I rather sit in a state of panic, not being able to like do anything or accepting that I can't do anything and changing that narrative and just being like, right, 
What a difference that's this made is. This well. is what it is. Yeah. And worst comes to absolute worst. If there's no coaches or if there's no trains, and I have to stay a night in Birmingham, then I have to stay a night in Birmingham. Mm-hmm. I've got the luxury of being able to have that as an option. So no one's going to die. Mm-hmm. Everything's going to be fine. And I think that's my my friend Ellie. Like she's very into like crystals and manifestations mm. and like you're beautiful, you're loved. And Aww. mine has to be now. Nobody's going to die. Mm. Nobody will die. Mm. Nothing detrimental is going to happen if this post doesn't go out at 9 a.m. Yeah. If my train is cancelled. If I'm not there in Liverpool handing out these cards. It's all going to be okay. Mm, amazing. Because um, obviously, like, you know, I think when we talk about like emotional well being, physical well being, like, if you think about diet, sleep, like, mental health, mm. we can always tend to think mm. one's over here, one's over here, mm. one's over here, but they are in string. Yeah, completely. So I just wanted to ask you, like, do you know how, like, a lack of sleep or not eating, like, skipping meals or not eating the right food, do you know, are you aware of how that can impact yes. you emotionally? Emotionally, my irritability. And I think recently over the last few days, because I've not been sleeping very well. Mm. And I think now I'm getting better with food. I don't think when we, when we first met, I think I was telling you, I just, I didn't eat. Mm -hmm. And I actually realized just from reading a book um, that I picked up, my friend booked me to go and do a float. You know, those floats, have you ever, do you know about the floats? It's like these pods. They have one on on Victoria Street and it's basically Mm -hmm. like this like salt water pod and you go and lie in it for an hour and it's supposed to like really relax you and like you're supposed to fall asleep and it's basically like a really deep like relaxation method. Mm -hmm. And I was a bit apprehensive at the time and you're supposed to like get in naked. It's very, very like, (laughs) very hippie, very cosmic scousery. Um, And I really enjoyed it and I really benefited from it. And Mm -hmm. in in this like, um, in this pod place, um, it's called Float Planet. um, There was like a cool down room where you could go to after and there were loads of books. And it was so strange because the first book that I picked up, I opened it and it was about anxiety and food and about mm-hmm. the blockage that you will give yourself when you feel anxious. And it's about like just putting like a cap on your appetite. And it is. And I, when I read that, I was like, that really resonates with me because when I'm anxious, I don't eat. And it's not that I'm hungry. It's like I'm just nothing. Oh, right. It's just like I, I don't want to eat. And I, I have been skipping loads of meals. And there's been days like particularly like in the summer that I just wouldn't eat for ages. And then I've been like, oh, my God, I haven't eaten. Mm. No wonder I have a headache and I feel mm. horrible. Mm. Um. And I think over summer as well, like my appreciation again for just like home cooked food. And there's been times that I've got in at like 2 a.m. and I'm like, do you know what? I just want to make something. I don't want to eat another bloody KFC on the service station. Mm. I don't want to eat something fried and processed. I want to have something fresh. I want to have something homely. I want to have something warm and something that like I've made myself. Mm. And again, like similar to hotels, like I don't really like eating out anymore because I feel like we've done it so much that my appreciation for just like eating at home mm. has gotten like so much stronger because it's like, ah, fresh protein Um, but I have I have gotten better with eating sleep at the moment has been quite difficult Mm -hmm. and I think in the last few days my irritability and just like my threshold for just like anything has just been well it's funny you say that because like I just wanted to kind of like highlight this because again I don't think people realize the direct impact it has on your Mm. emotional health so it's like emotional responses to like a lack of sleep be fluctuations in mood irritability (laughs) ask my boyfriend honestly I've been biting his head off at everything (laughs) well it's funny he says that because it says uh, shift we uh, shift workers uh, may not appreciate the consequences of what's going on. In some sectors, the divorce rate is six times higher than in, in, in night shift workers compared to oh, day shift t- workers. <laughs> don't tell me that. So don't it's tell basically that. just saying... I am a night shift worker as <laughs> well. Yeah, you are, you <laughs> are. But it's just to make you aware and your partner aware. So if you are a bit irritable, they can be a bit more understanding. So it's not to I say... I know, he's very understanding. I know, he's very, he understanding. <laughs> very understanding. It's good to just be aware of how it can impact your yeah, relationships and everything like but that. But also, on top of that, I'm a woman. I have hormones. Yeah, I'm on the contraceptive pill. Like, there's so many factors regardless of like being and I think that's I think as well like you know having a male manager and being in these male spaces and Mm. always being confronted with like male artist liaisons or promoters or tour managers it's like we are we are women yeah in Ibiza I was on my period and I wanted to die there were Mm. moments that I was like oh my god sometimes when I'm on my period I don't even want to and I know a lot of women will relate to this just on a normal day I don't even want to look at myself in the mirror let alone Mm. bloody go on stage and like have to perform to like hundreds of people and I think there's all of these things that are different for us because our bodies Mm. are you know they're tubed in a different way so mm. our exhaustion and our like emotions are going to be different to yeah, you know that of a male DJ and because we've got a battle with that anyway yeah it's constantly changing through the whole month yeah. anyway absolutely yeah and um, but something that i thought was really interesting it says that when you um don't have enough sleep your brain forgets the positive experiences and remembers more of the negative ones oh my ones. goodness Oh my God, yeah. yeah. Um, it also says that you will fail to pick up social signals from others and we lose empathy from yeah. others as well. I think picking up social signals, I think it's because what I was saying, like you're just in this bubble mm. and you kind of just become a bit numb. I think that's really, yeah. But the, um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. What was the thing you said before, sorry? Um, 
about before you said social signals you said um oh yeah so um your brain forgets a positive experience and remembers yeah. the negative ones i feel like i'm, I'm a sucker for doing that so I'm it says that you're basing that. your decisions upon negative memories over your positive yeah. ones so it affects your decision making yes um i think it makes it uh, increases risk taking and impulsivity yes as well. Yes, I feel like, not that I've become a pessimist, but I, I was saying this the other day to Hannah, the other girl and Girls Don't Sing, and we were talking about a set that we've got to do on Friday. And um, I was just like, oh my God, right now thinking about that set, I'm just like, bloody hell. I'm absolutely knackered just mm. at the thought of it. And I think we both did it. We were just like, let's just step away from that. Let's just think about what we're doing. Like people, you know, go and sit in office jobs or at computers or, you know, they, they do loads of things or they, you know, they've got to clean and they've got to do that. Our job is essentially having a laugh together playing music that we love to a crowd and like when you just like dissect it like that and I feel like it's so easy for, for us to be like really like negative and be harsh and like you know be really tired and I feel like at the moment I'm always complaining but when I actually look at it I'm like this is what I want to do this is what makes me so happy when I'm on that stage mm. I am not, I'm not thinking like that when I'm actually in the moment playing yeah the DJ the stage, side of it is the best bit it's the, everything around it's it everything it's really around hard. it and I'm like actually I feel like recently I have been quite pessimistic and I have complained a lot when really if I actually look at it from like an outsider's point of view and just like on paper, this is what we're doing is brilliant. And I get to experience all of this stuff, regardless if I can't really like hone in on those positive experiences, they are there and I've got them and they're like, and I've got them photographed and they're stuff that I can, I don't know, sounds easy, but like I can show my kids and like mm. their memories that we've made like together. So, and I think again, that's another positive of like having a group. Like if one of us is feeling a bit pessimistic and down mm. and a bit, you know, bit lethargic sometimes yeah. the other one can be like oh shut up like look at what we're doing do you know what mm. I mean and especially before a set if we are feeling like that if we're a bit knackered we can all kind of help ourselves like dig ourselves out of that hole and be like right come on mm. everyone in a circle let's um let's all sink yeah. in by our like do you know what I mean let's yeah. let's all do something that can all raise our energy and I think when you when you do work in a group it is natural to kind of like I don't know whether you want to or not you can infringe and offload your emotions onto everybody mm. else so mm. I think it's you know staying wary of that but also I don't know, having someone be like, right, come on guys, let's have a drink, let's, let's do that. And I think if I was to do that on my own, would I be able to get to a place um, of motivation to do that? I don't mm. think I would. I will just say though, because I did have a chat with a, a DJ um, called Ben Pierce. I don't know if you've heard of him. Why do I know that name? I do, I do recognise that yeah, name. It's from a few, he's still DJing, I had a big track um, quite a few years ago. But when I was chatting to him, he said that he was touring in Australia and he was obviously feeling like shit, basically. But then in Australia as well, you've got the time difference to factor in. That would be uh, mental. Yeah, jet lag and everything, yeah. But he was saying that he was having a really bad time, but he was describing how guilty you can feel, like a bit like what yes. you've explained. Like, oh, but look how lucky we are. That's how so dare true. I say? Oh, like, you know? yeah, that's what. And, and that's really, really common. And we were just saying, look, it's, it's okay. it, like all these emotions that you're feeling are completely mm. normal and it's okay to feel up, down, left, right and all over mm. the shop. And not to minimise how you feel either. Mm. And I think that's really important. Just that it's okay to feel mm. like shit. And yeah, obviously you don't want to be, you know, be in that like negative space for too long. Mm. But I think it's just give yourself a break and understand 100%, that. Hundred you know? percent. But I think it's about articulating that, and especially like, how do you articulate? Like, you know, how much of that do you preserve to yourself? How much of that do you let people know about? Like, mm. Sophia, as I was telling you, suffers from um, type one diabetes, and not yesterday the day before was world diabetes awareness day so she did like a whole takeover on our instagram and she was like showing everyone like the complications and the level of like extreme care that comes with it and i think those people realized like bloody hell like managing that as a normal 21 year old but also like as a dj she was just being really transparent she was like it can make me feel really leth lethargic if my blood sugars are low mm -hmm. you know the girls have seen firsthand the effects if i don't have enough blood sugar if my blood sugars are too high or if they're too low and how that affects you know our work you know not only as mm -hmm. me as sophia but also you know the industry and how I feel and this and that and I think people that are honest um Emerald I think I told you about Emerald as well like yeah. Emerald was really transparent on World Mental Health Day about you know her struggles with addiction and therapy and she just wrote this post and it was so transparent and I messaged her after and I was like thank you for that mm. specifically about therapy mm -hmm. and just like I know it sounds like really like cliche but you know the more people talk about it, it eradicates stigmas and things like that yeah. but it's true and it's yeah. what it goes back to what I was saying before the more we talk about it the more we can disassociate ourselves from projecting ourselves as being these like walking talking DJs with like mm. you know no issues and it, we do like we're human beings it's naturally going to affect us so mm. I think Anybody who can articulate themselves, like Sophia did, like Emma did, on social media, which is really hard, and also it's really personal. Like, mm. who knows what kind of like, I don't know, trauma or like yeah. pain that could like, you know, stir up putting that out there. And I think it is really vulnerable to like, you know, kind of put yourself on the on the, on the crossfire. That's what it feels like. Crossfire firing line. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like. Um, so I think there's real admiration in in doing that. 
um, particularly on social media, because it can be so hard to articulate and you are opening yourself up to, I don't know, a world of opinions and yeah. and potentially backlash. Mm. Um, so I think anybody that does that is um, is really brave. Yeah. Basically. And has she, has she got professional support to help her navigate her type 1 diabetes? Um, I think she has like... Reg I think she has like a doctor that she sees mm. um, but I know that she's very very keen on doing more stuff um, particularly with the platform for Girls Don't Sink I think it's been a bit of a weird couple of months just because we've been so busy and I know that she really wanted to do something big for it but again life didn't permit that because we've mm. been so busy we've been here she's just started a new job as well so she's really busy and you know she's navigating all of that so mm. I think it's something as well that we want to continue to push throughout the year not just on world diabetes day this mm. is something that affects her oh, yeah. every single day three six five days of the year not just on world diabetes day so i think it's definitely something that obviously we need to stay vigilant about and we need to kind of continue to vocalize and also sophia wants to she's created like her own little community she put out a call out a few months ago and like she kind of started a whatsapp group chat with other people especially young people that have type 1 diabetes mm. it's quite you know it's quite taboo there's not many people that speak about it and she, i remember her saying like when we were on the train she was like it's really nice like we're all just talking about I know that we might feel like shit today or this happened or that happened. So for her to have, obviously, you know, we'll, we'll try our hardest to understand and empathise, but we never will really mm. because we don't have it. So for her to have that bubble of people and those connections um, is really beneficial. And also, you know, bringing it to the forefront of, you know, navigating that within the DJ world, electronic music mm. is something that we all definitely want to continue yeah, to push yeah i was going to ask because i know that like sleep deprivation when or when you've not had enough sleep the night before your response to, to food your blood sugar yeah, yeah, food is yeah, a lot yeah, worse yeah, so yeah, she knows yeah, all yeah, that yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and obviously like alcohol like yeah. makes you have blood like low yeah, blood sugar yeah. and all that so she knows even all for that. me like the, even like i don't have type 1 diabetes but even for me like the day after like what you were saying that irritability and that like that feeling of just like whoa like mm. feel a bit faint or like I haven't eaten especially when you've had a heavy night drinking mm. and like you forget or I don't know like you're just in a bit of a haze or you're being you know pushed into a van or you've mm. got to get another train mm. like yeah it, it, it can be hard to, to kind of keep track on especially like Sophia like similar to us like you're in the moment she's living in the moment mm. she wants to enjoy it she's giving it her all so um but you know there is definitely room to you know to forget that or not be on top of it which mm. obviously can lead to yeah. to real complications which has happened so all of us it's, it's a shared responsibility now you mm. know to, to ensure that that doesn't happen i was telling you before about that artist liaison you know that was kind of like refusing to give us a lucas a sport that is an essential part to our rider but also her health and safety and her life mm. essentially mm. um and that's just the kind of ignorance and dismissal that we're met with constantly not just surrounding you know our demands for a rider um, that aren't diva-ish, that aren't asking mm. too much. They're really, really integral. And um, the artist season was just like, you know, you can only be asking for that kind of stuff if you're Carl Cox. And we were just shocked. Obviously, we, you know, we complained about him. We also, you know, told him um, mm. correctly. But um, yeah, just that level. It's that level of like lack of understanding that obviously can, you know, spot those kinds of conversations. So, so I did just want to talk about like talk about therapy and stuff mm -hmm. and the stigma that comes with that, which mm -hmm. I'm really surprised by because obviously I think. You know, mental health and everyone's awareness around mental health mm. um, is come on so much. Mm. And I just think I'm quite surprised, especially in the music industry, that's still a bit of a stigma. Like, oh, yeah. there's got to be something wrong with me to, mm. to go into therapy when mm. actually it just helps you work through the challenges that mm. you're constantly going through in life. Yeah. So do you, are you aware of like that stigma in the music industry still? I think so. And I think it's your right. So what are you going to therapy for? Or like, mm. you know, there's got to be um, something wrong. Yeah. Or like, yeah, my friend Kennedy, she recently did a podcast and she was saying that I think she said to a friend, um, oh, I'm going to therapy and my friend was like what for like, literally, mm. like, what, like what for and I think you're right it's about I think I've I've been saying for quite a few months now that I really want to go to therapy but I think it's so easy to say it than actually like push yourself into it I think I'm scared of I don't know being in that vulnerable place again and for me it's the I've been to therapy since I was very young I think 13 14 I was going to therapy whether it would be in school whether it be external um I went to family therapy at one point as well. And I think for me, at this point in my life, it's about sitting in front of somebody and like, t like somebody that doesn't know me, it's like an alien having to recount and like retell every, do you know what I mean? Like mm. having to be like, hi, I'm Gaia. And like that, that interaction feels very, just feels very scary for me right now. But I would really like to go to therapy and I know it could benefit me, but I think actually getting to that place and also my experience with therapists is like kind of trial and error, like finding someone that I can really connect with. It's all about the connection with the therapist, definitely. Yeah. I don't think, like I know that I should and I know that I re there's a part of me that really wants to go and unhash all of these things. And I think for me, it's not about unpacking the past, it's about focusing on the, the now. The present, that's what I was going to say. And yeah. dealing, com like finding things that can help combat these emotions and, you know, these flare-ups, these anxiety flare-ups and 
Because um, the thing is, I've been in therapy a while now, and I love therapy, but yeah. I'm not talk, I'm not in there because I've got an issue or yeah. any problem. I'm in there. I, I go in there. You know, obviously, I've been really lucky. We've got a great relationship, so I feel very. I trust her. You know, I'm very comfortable mm. with her and stuff. But it's kind of like, well, what's happened this week? What's mm. going on now? It's mm. never well. Let's you know unpack dig. your inner child. Yeah, no, it's nothing yeah. like. I think there's a, a you know a preconception of what it's like, and for me, it's just never been like that. Yeah. You sit down and have a chat with someone that you like. I really want to go, but I, I've been saying it a lot. I've been saying it a lot that I really want to go back to therapy. Yeah. I think it's about. I think therapy for me has always been something like you cannot one you cannot force somebody to go. No. Definitely. And you can only go. This is how I see it be patient with me on this analogy <laughs> but like you need to go to therapy with the mirror already in your hand so you need to be like strong enough to be holding the mirror essentially mm. and you go to a therapist and all the therapist is going to do is help you raise that mirror up mm. but I don't have that mirror in my hand right now I just mm. kind of need a bit of help I think it's, it would put me in a little bit of a vulnerable place like I think it's the whole calling out like the call out and like the asking I don't know that whole process because I've done it so many times before mm. of like going to therapy for the first time with a new therapist and sitting in front of them that is the thing that is putting me off mm. even though I know the benefits that could come with it it's just a bit like I don't know I feel like it's kind of like antidepressants I've been on antidepressants before and it's like it kind of gets worse before it gets good and mm. I think it's kind of like that with my relationship with therapy anyway it's like those initial sessions have always been really hard but then when you break through all of that Hmm. then it gets really good so I find I find it quite similar well, the thing is with therapy, I think it's just about being vulnerable I think I'm I would struggle sitting in a chair now even though I'm kind of doing it like this is th this is therapy <laughs> but do you know what I mean but like I have a I, I don't know I think it's um I think it's really vulnerable just going and like sitting with somebody new and like yeah I don't know I know what you mean um but also with therapy, they're all like therapists in general, they're all trained in different types of therapy. Exactly. So I think it's also trying to find the right person who's trained in the right therapy, uh, mm. type of therapy mm. where you'll talk about now and not mm. the past. And would you feel more comfortable going, not, I'm not suggesting that you do, but would you feel more comfortable with being speaking with someone who's talking about now? Like, yeah. you, say, like, you know, you missed the train and talking about that and like, oh, when I got myself a glass of wine the other day and it went this, that. So, like, literally, what you're in and out uh, yeah. of now, would that, and would that be something that you would feel more comfortable with? A hundred percent. And I think it's not about personal stuff. I think it's about pragmatic stuff. Yeah, it's about the it's reality. Not about, yeah. It's not about unpacking like childhood stuff or yeah. stuff that's happened in the past. It's about pragmatic, practical ways for me to deal with these flare ups of anxiety mm. to the point where I fundamentally think that, um, I don't know, I'm not good enough or I feel really scared to go on my phone or I'm letting people down or another thing like everybody hates me. Sorry, I don't know. Everybody Aww. hates me. Um, but like that is, and it, it sounds really mad or like particularly like, in those moments on the coach, obviously Matty says nobody's dying, but physically that is how I feel. I do mm. feel like I'm gonna die. I do feel like I can't breathe. Um, and it's like all of these horrendous thoughts about yourself. It's like, it's like, it's like, ah, like they're just like screaming mm. at you. And it's about being like, okay, how do I just separate myself from that? Calm when, the and it doesn't, I, I shouldn't have to go to Wagamama's and have a glass of wine. I wanna be able to learn how to do that, whether it's at a bus shelter in Birmingham or before a set at a festival this summer. How can I detach myself from everything going on, tap into that and be like, whew. And I think finding somebody that could help me do that. But I also think it's because of my relationship with my therapist. Like, I don't know, I've had some weird experiences. Mm. And I think only now I've grown up and been like, mm. and particularly male therapists, you know, feeling very patronized, feeling very con like condescended. I had one in, in, in uni and I just thought, you're a, like, you just don't understand me. And I think having a female. Yeah. Yeah, it's, mine's female, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I could ever have a male therapist uh, yeah, again. Yeah. There's certain things I was talking about, I was like, you've just got no idea. You've just got no mm -hmm. idea. And then also there was a reluctancy and embarrassment for me to like be really honest and for really open up to open up because I was like, you're a man, I don't know. I just feel a bit, mm -hmm. bit uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I do really, really want to go back to therapy. Mm. I just think the steps of getting there are just like, I just feel a little bit like, whoa. Yeah, I think it's just a case of finding the right therapist who is trained in the right type of therapy mm. in the now, yeah. basically. But then for me, it's like how many of those therapists do I have to go through? How many of those initial like, and I think if you've been to therapy, you'll understand like those initial like taster. What, what do they call them? Not taster, but like. I do know what you mean. They do, like, they do um, offer those. They're yeah. like, I don't know how many of them I can do to, until I find my right therapist because I don't know. I just don't know if I'm that comfortable yet. Mm. It just feels, it, for me, and I know it sounds quite dramatic, but it just feels like I'm going to a person being like, hi, this is everything that's wrong with me. And this is what I need help in. Well, actually, no, this is what I need help in. This is not what's wrong with me. Yeah, exactly. It's there just kind of like, well, like I say, when I sit down and I'm chatting with mine, it's not like, I never ever think there's something wrong with me. Mm. I'm, I'm just like, she's like, so how's your week been? And I'm, like, I'm just talking about my mm. week. That's it. It's not like... I think it's about changing that narrative think, in my head. I think so, yeah. And obviously you've had some negative experiences, so that's going to have an impact. So, mm. 
Um, I think I'm worried about what it could bring out as well. Yeah. I think the last couple of times I went to therapy, like the last time I was in therapy was, not, yeah, last year I was going, I was seeing a therapist quite regular. And I just remember one time after therapy, I was supposed to go into work and I was just like, I messaged my boss. I was like, I can't, I can't go back in. I just felt so, I don't know. I think maybe we unpacked, it was a bit heavy. Yeah. You know what I mean, her approach of things. Yeah. And it was really beneficial at the time, but it was like how I felt after was really damaging. Oh, really? And I'm, I think I'm worried about what it could bring up and, I don't know, yeah, you know, how that could make me feel, like, long-term and mm. will that make me feel worse and how, how would I deal with that um, now? If I go to therapy and the next day I've got a set, am I going to be feeling, you know, still in that, I don't know, that headspace of feeling Needing quite... Needing to process and stuff. That's yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, I get that, okay. Well, obviously, in, like, like up-and-coming episodes, going to speak, be speaking to therapists and stuff like mm. that as well, so I can kind of, like, bring that up and, mm. and see what they suggest. Yeah. Also, as well, it's about your approach. Like, like you said, there's so many different types of therapy. Yeah. I think it's about finding the right one for you. I think the, some of the types of, of, of therapy I've had growing up have been really vigorous mm. and felt very, like, I don't know, like um, very intense. Yeah, and trying to like get to the root of things. Yes. Yeah. And like one therapist made me like speak to my younger self right. a lot, and like it was all about my inner child, and I was like, I don't want to go, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm an adult now. Yeah, yeah. What about adult guy? Adult yeah. guy needs more yeah. of a hug than child guy. Child guy <laughs> was all right. Child guy was all right. Yeah. Like, adult guy needs a hug. Not, yeah. and I just found that a bit like, oh God. Yeah, well, this is the thing. Some of them are like, their approach, they go in straight into childhood, mm -hmm. and that's not what you want or what no. you need. And there, there are therapists out there that, mm -hmm. that don't do that, and I can be a testament for that, because I haven't, I've got one who doesn't do that. Okay, give me your number. <laughs> <laughs> give me your number. And it's, it's really like, I always look forward to it. It's like, mm. uh, to, be, to be honest, for me, it's like a, ah. Oh, but how often, often do you go? Do you go every week? Once a week. Okay, I think that's what I need to do. And also, it's about, for me, being strict and finding, the, making the time for it. It's just If I can make the time yourself. to wash my hair. Yeah, absolutely. I can make the time for therapy. Well, that's the thing, yeah, and it's just, like I say, it's, it's, it feels like self-care to me. Yeah. It's not I've, like that whole, when I first went in, I was like, oh, this isn't what I, I thought it was going to be. Mm. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> this, is all right, this is all right, isn't it? Whereas like, obviously before I went in, I was a bit like, oh, I didn't know what, what it was going to be like. But yeah, mm -hmm. I, I love it. And, like, and when you were a DJ, were you, were, did you have therapy? No, no. But this is the whole reason why I'm setting up Chaos and Art, because if I had therapy back then, well, this is the thing, even when I was DJing, I was being affected by the challenges. Like I was lonely, I was sad, I was out of mm. sorts. I was sleep deprived, all of these things, but I thought there was something wrong with me. <coughs> but yeah, I think, well, this is the thing, like management have got their role to do. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the time people think management need to be therapists as well, and they need to mm -hmm. emotionally support, and they do to a certain extent. But I think if I had professional mm -hmm. support outside of the music mm -hmm. industry, that was already in place. This is the thing, like you think, even when I was suffering from those challenges, it never <coughs> dawned on me for a second, maybe I should go to therapy. Like, cause or a it, doctor, did you go to a doctor? I think no. Because I, I didn't think, um, that it's almost like you've got to be in a, a certain situation or mm. something quite severe, there's got to be mm. something wrong with you mm, or, mm, you know, mm. and I just obviously didn't click into place that, you know, I don't, I don't fit into that box so I won't mm. go to therapy. But in reality, you know, I was just being affected by what was going on in the industry. And when I went to therapy, because when, when I went into therapy that we ended up talking about my music experience and she was like, I was like, oh. I was like, so that's why I was feeling the way I was because of X, Y, Z. And she explains mm -hmm. all these little nuances of like, even the thing like coming off stage and um, what the a psychological process of that is and why you feel like that. Mm -hmm. and, and if you do X, Y, Z, you know, you, you can you know help yourself in when you're coming off stage. Mm -hmm. And and uh, also when you're moving into different environments around different, different people all the time, like you said, you're going from one gate to the next to the next and you haven't got time to process. She said, you literally don't have a cycle. Like, there's a psychological um, cycle that we all have to go through and you literally don't have the time to go through all these <coughs> psychological processes. Is. So that can really affect you by the time, I don't know, you're five gigs in. So it's all these little things of just understanding how we work. It's like, mm. oh, well, that's why I felt like that. There's mm. nothing wrong with me. I'm not, like, faulty or anything. And that was, like, I was like, I was like if I had this before, <coughs> back when I was DJing, I wouldn't have had to have left. Mm. And that's the whole reason for setting this up, really. Mm. Well, yeah. And I think that's why, I don't know, I feel like that's probably why I feel so comfortable talking to you. It's like, mm. you've had that experience. And also, like, I mean, maybe... I mean, I, from from my perspective, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Like, it literally brought you to breaking point. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? To the point that you were like, I can't, like, I can't do yeah, this anymore. Can't do it anymore. And yeah. now you're basically like dedicating your life to, I don't know. Well, what it feels like to me is like making sure that this doesn't happen to well, that's anybody exactly else. It. Yeah, that's exactly it. I was and like, that's very, that's that's very nice. Honestly, when you reached out to me, I was like, what? And I remember sending it to our manager. I think I sent it to the group chat, and I was like, guys, this is like, 
I don't know, this is like someone answering my calls, like <laughs> being able to speak to somebody that has like such an awareness and also as a woman, sorry, mm -hmm. sorry, it's important, mm -hmm. and has been in that point and has felt all of these things and have done it alone. And also now like all of this research, like you're getting your own, like you're getting your own secondary research from your own therapy and like putting mm -hmm. it into this. And I just find that really, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> That's why obviously it's going to be a big culture change for somebody to say you start a DJ now or new artists coming through. For It'd be great to have a culture change and a, a shift in mindset where People are like, oh yeah, so when you start the music, it's going to be challenging, so we're going to get you a therapist who's going to be the right type of therapist for you, mm. with the right type of therapy. You know, you're going to have a, someone's going to help you with your sleep, your diet, mm. and make sure that you're, you know, mm. in good shape for when mm -hmm. you're when you're DJing. Because it's, you know, the challenges are always going to be there, but there are things that you can do to, you know, look after yourself mm. around them. Mm -hmm. And instead of letting artists struggle on their own or get I think it's about where, age as well. Like you said, I think you're quite a similar age to me. Like. I'm still finding my feet as a DJ, but I'm still mm. finding my feet as Gaia, as a 24 yeah. year old woman, like understanding, you know, what, what helps me, what doesn't help me, what, what my triggers are. And mm. I'm still navigating that. And I think, I think within the music industry, particularly with our journey, similar to the lad that I was talking about before, like he's literally just like stumbled into being a pop star. And yeah. like when that happens really quickly, and you know, I think it is about the exposure and the social media. And I think a lot of my anxiety does come with that about the being seen and about mm. like having to be online, but also not having to be like having to post this. Oh, no. even just like not being a DJ, not being a DJ, being a normal teenage girl mm. navigating secondary school with the yeah. likes of TikTok and Instagram and pressure and this mm. and that and Jesus Christ. I do want to apologise for my constant coughing, by the way. No, don't but me. this is this is the reality. We're being this, being is this is the like this is the product of sleep deprivation being run down, not saying no, and pushing myself to my limits. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So on that note, so if you could envision a future where the challenges didn't have as much of an impact on you, what would that look like? Hmm. I think I'd be, I think I'd be a lot, and it's about, it's, I think we've spoken about a lot, it is about that groundedness. Mm -hmm. And it is about like, not, it feels like, especially in the last few weeks, I've been like, somebody's been pulling my arm, somebody's been my leg. And it's not just about DJing, it's not just about the industry, it's about what I was saying before. I've got a mum, I've got a dad, I've got a boyfriend, I've got friends, I've got friends back home, I've got a granddad, I've got an auntie. And it's about like, it feels like I'm constantly doing this. Mm. Like, this is Gaia's world. My family, my home, growing up in London, feeling homesick, this, that, I don't know, all of that kind of stuff. But then this is like the music industry and it's about like finding a way to, I don't know, bring them together. Not like this, but like really like, like the cogs can turn like nicely. And I think an industry with kind of that infrastructure in place would look like more people unapologetically speaking about their experiences, like at the forefront of conversations, whether that be on social media, magazines, interviews, people being transparent, but also recognizing that that transparency, not everybody can get to that place. I don't even think I'm in that place to be like, I mean, I've been very transparent with you, but mm. because I've done this with you, I wonder how transparent I would have been if it would be with somebody, I don't know, yeah. from DJ Mag that yeah. wanted to interview me, how much stuff would I have actually like felt comfortable, you know, mm. declaring? And it mm. is a declaration, especially because yeah. something like this is filmed. But also, like I was saying before, if I can be inspired by other people like Emerald and Sophia being so open, then mm. that has now inspired me to be so open and who knows who that will inspire. And I think as well, particularly for me, because I'm a very bubbly, like confident character, I think a lot of the stuff, especially like in the last years, it's like, oh, I had no idea you suffered from things like this. Mm. Or even when I put like the occasional thing on social media, it's like, you know what? I had no idea. And it's like that stigma of like, I can still be bubbly and still be confident and still absolutely be riddled with anxiety and like crippling, like self-loathing, like, I don't know, energy around me. Mm. Um, and I think it's, that's also a lot of stuff that I've put on myself, like having to be this character, like having to be this person, like da 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 da. I don't have to be that person all the time. Yeah. I can switch off. Um, yeah. I can say no, sorry, I don't, I don't really want a picture or I just need a minute, I'm really sorry. And I think um, I apologize far too much, far too much. So yeah. a future without these limitations for me would just be feeling really comfortable in my own skin, um, being around other like, like-minded people, particularly within the music industry that, um, I don't know, that just feel really comfortable, you know. It's normal to say no and it's normal to put like, you know, to cancel a gig last minute and to, but also on social media, like again, if you're comfortable with that, but also behind the scenes, having conversations with promoters being like, you know what, I'm really, really sorry. I, I cannot do this gig. I feel really burnt out. And I've had promoters be quite snotty about it, but then I've also had promoters be like, you know what, 
completely understand. Hats off for you for li to listening to your body, cool. listening to your body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's about having more of a awareness, not just for DJs, not just for people following us on our social media or for people that buy tickets to our events, but the promoters, the organisations, um, the artist liaisons, the tour managers. And I think if there's more of an awareness about, like I said, just like not being these walking, talking DJs, about being human, about having a breakdown. There's been times that, you know, I've cried or I've done this or... You know, I've just felt a little bit emotional. Even today, like, it is emotional. It is yeah. emotional talking about these things. Yeah. Whether it's on stage, whether it's not on stage, whether it's coming on, coming off. And I think if there's a greater awareness about that, everybody can just feel a, little, a lot better. Well, I, I think so, yeah. And I think, like, that, when I first started, that was the problem. That there was no one talking about it. Mm -hmm. So I literally went in with the blinders mm -hmm. on. When it started happening, I was like, what the... What's going on? Mm. What's wrong with me? And then you get caught up in the mm. whirlwind and then it's all just so confusing, isn't it? So I think doing this is really going to help people. I think this is like the and first And I do first think step. people watching this, particularly, again, whether it's people that come to our sets, people that have never met me before, but maybe have watched Our Girls Don't Sing. I don't, I don't know. Mm. Anyone, so maybe someone stumbling on across this, but like particularly other DJs, because this is how I felt when I heard Michael, Michael Aldag, when I was hearing him talk at that panel talk last weekend, I was just like, oh my God. I felt like I could have cried because I was like, this is so nice. Like hearing, and again, I wasn't saying that I took like, I was happy that he was suffering as well, yeah. but I was like, this is so true. And I was like, oh my God, like, like you said, feeling alone, like other mm. people feel this way. Yeah. It is normal. And yeah. And I think there'll be a lot of DJs particularly that will watch this and be like, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So yeah, I think it's really good. And thank you so much for reaching out to me that time on Instagram because it was, it was so lovely. And having that phone call and then meeting up with you, like, I remember after we met in Leaf, like literally just messaging the girls being like, I've just met this incredible woman. Aww. I have, and it was just so nice to be able to talk to somebody that just knew like so like in depth, like the struggle that mm -hmm. comes with it. Um, and the fact that you're doing this right now, it's just, it's really great. Yeah, yeah. I've been having like goosebumps, like so many things that you've said are just like, you know, it takes Aww. me back and like mm -hmm. it really resonates with me. So and I do think this is gonna help a lot of people. So. I do think so as well. Thank you so much, my dear. Well, thank, you, thank you. Oh. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank <laughs> you. And um, yeah, yeah. Apologies for the coughing again because um, I can understand that. Would this be is the real right. podcast. This is the real. <laughs> this is the real stuff. <laughs> nice people. Oh, thank, thank you, you mate. So much.